Hello, I'm your host, Grayson Brolty, coming to you live from SAE's Government Industry Meeting in Washington, D.C. If you've listened to other episodes in the series, you know I love coming to the show because it brings together my policy and industry friends for important policy conversations. I'm absolutely honored to introduce our next guest from GI, Francesca Favaro, Head of Safety Best Practices, Waymo. Welcome to the podcast, Francesca. Hi, Grayson. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. Waymo's rocking and rolling. The, the company is scaling. You're operating f- flawless vehicles. I was in one three weeks ago in San Francisco in the rain going around, and it was magical. I put Miles Davis kind of blue on, and, I was, and the car was just smooth. Okay, this is the future, and this is what it should be. But to get there, a lot of work has to go into that, a lot of, a lot of safety work. And you've written some really great intellectual papers on all, on all, all things safety. Overall, Francesca, how is Waymo approaching safety? Yeah, that's uh, you know a bit of a loaded question. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start by saying very uh, deliberately because if you look at some of the of the data, it took us a little over two years to do that first one million of what we call rider only miles, which means real deployment of the fully autonomous technology with no autonomous specialist on board, so no safety um, test drivers, if you will. It took us over two years. It was from October of 2020 when we launched in in Phoenix up until the beginning of 2023. And we published this this big and very important paper for us, the collision performance in the first 1 million RO miles that we had ever driven. But then, you know, within the 2023 alone, before the end of the year, we published another paper and that had over 7 uh, million RO miles within it to to account for the uh, safety performance. And so when you look at that and how the difference in scale, really these gradual and purposeful approach that, that we've always had, we've been called kind of the grandma of AV and slow and steady. But to be honest, it's true. And that's how we have approached safety as well to get there, we needed to develop a safety framework that could assess, evaluate and, and measure safety to support these gradual uh, scaling approach that we had always envisioned from from the beginning. You're mentioning the, the Bloomberg opinion piece called you the grandma. I would call you, I, I don't know, some people find the term offensive. I would call you the doing it right company because you've been slow and slow and steady. And then we all know from children's books, slow and steady wins the race. And you have the safety framework. How was that initially incubated or, or, or developed? And I have to give credit where credit is due because a lot of that groundwork was done prior to me joining Waymo. I joined in, in 2020, uh, which was the year where we launched the, the first commercial uh, deployment, the Waymo One service in, in Phoenix. So a lot of that groundwork happened in, in 2019 and even earlier than that. And it was a very cross-functional effort because one of the key understandings is that the second that you want to bring this technology to the public, you need to establish a very rigorous and, and robust decision making and governance process for it. And so the safety framework really is that tool that helps us approve every single software release that we want to deploy on, on public roads. And so a cross-functional team, uh, engineers, of course, but also product, uh, uh, legal safety experts, uh, comms came together to figure out how to structure it right. And they started from our mission, the company mission. We want to drive you safely from point A to point B with the goal of reducing traffic injuries and, and fatalities. This is uh, kind of the core of a lot of our uh, most recent performance geared papers. And with that mission, they developed principles. The principles are supposed to guide Waymo nuts in their daily work. So we have development principles, we have deployment principles, uh, we have risk management principles. And then it came to the methodologies. And that's really um, some of the the core of the safety framework and kind of the the groundwork that we started sharing in in 2020 when we started publishing and kind of being a little bit more uh, transparent. And the goal there was to take stock of all of the literature, of everything that had been done before, understand what portion of, let's say, the rigor from system engineering and system safety could be applied to our use case and where instead we needed to pioneer, where we needed to develop new methodologies to evaluate um, the vehicle progress, to evaluate rules of the road compliance or um, other types of of metrics that, you know, couldn't necessarily be applied to uh, framings and safety approaches that existed prior to automated vehicles. I did work early on around fatigue research. What type of behavioral science overall went into the framework? Because if you, I'm, I'm the 
weirdo that reads all your papers because I find them <laughs> really interesting. But you learn a lot about Waymo as an organization and you do a lot of individuals just look at you from what you post publicly on X or the Waymo blog. But when you actually read the papers, you get into the nuts and bolts of how serious Waymo takes safety. It's not a it's not a badge. It's, it's a culture, in my opinion. What what role did behavioral science play in developing the framework? Well, you know, there are very different branches and, and that was perhaps one of the uh, biggest uh, um, lessons learned, but also kind of eye-opening experiences when, when we wrote that paper for me, because I was in charge of, let's say, setting up the, the framework and the rigor behind the framework. And I drew a lot from my own uh, background in aviation, uh, fatigue for pilots. That's definitely um, a topic that is extremely important as you are learning to fly. And, you know, I just completed my, my flight training at that time, but I was also teaching to pilots. And so uh, that's the side that I was bringing in. But the uh, fatigue risk management framework and the paper really leveraged the expertise of uh, human factors, UX experts, uh, software engineers that had worked and had a background in cognitive engineering and yeah, general behavioral sciences. We had majors from psychology. So really cross-functionally across the spectrum of the disciplines uh, that have an impact and Fatigue is, is an extremely challenging problem because it's you know very natural and, and not necessarily something that can be objectively measured. And so that's why uh, we really wanted to have a wide variety of experts in the room when, when that paper and the framework itself was established. Yeah, well, the, the fatigue, we, we talked about this before, but for the safety tenants and the, the processes that you put ensured a very safe operation from that, and obviously now you're, you're rider only in, in multiple cities around the United States. What is the next evolution of that, of that fatigue? Is there a technology that you're looking at or, or a behavior that you're looking at since there's no longer a safety attendant? Is there something else of a framework that you're looking to develop? Yeah, and we get asked that question um, very often, like is there any spin-off for, uh, for other <laughs> projects? And um, we have had, uh, let's say, communications and, and chats with kind of the Google automotive counterpart as well uh, on that. But the reality is that while we do have uh, rider-only operations today, every time we are scaling in a new CD or in a new ODD highway that we have recently announced, autonomous specialists continue to play a key role for deployment of uh, the technology in a safe way. And we are still foreseeing uh, for the future to really rely on very rigorous testing with autonomous specialists on board. So uh, we're planning to continue to use our, our fatigue risk management framework for quite some time. The framework itself, just like the safety framework, is always in continuous evolution. So we try to make it more efficient as needed, uh, really always go back to the metrics. Is, is this uh, metric telling us the information that we're seeking? Is there anything uh, else that um, we could explore or we could do research on? So it's uh, very alive and active, I would say. It's it's good time if you look at the investment trends in Silicon Valley or the general trends. One of the biggest trends is towards high quality sleep. And that's becoming, and we've talked about this before, but if you don't sleep right, your, your fatigue is funny. I'm, I'm more in D.C. and my Uber driver was telling me, I don't really trust this person because I don't know if they got a good night's sleep. I'm like, where did this come from? And it, it just seems that sleep is becoming more and, and more of a topic today. And we know if you're fatigued that you're not necessarily going to make the right decisions. Why was the decision made, and it was the right decision, in 2020 to first publish the safety framework? Right now, when we look back at 2020, we don't necessarily realize how the, um, let's say, environment of, of communications around autonomous vehicle was back then. And it was really a bold and, and big step back then because we didn't just realize, um, we didn't just publish the safety framework itself. We paired that paper with another one, which was the uh, data and, and performance analysis of every collision that we had experienced, not just during testing on the road, but also any collision that we had counterfactually simulated. So every single time that one of these autonomous specialists that regained control of the vehicle and in simulation, we found that there was a potential because it's not fully deterministic, but we found very good indication that that would have resulted in a collision had the autonomous specialist not regained control. We published all of that. So uh, in 2020, this was unthinkable. And I still remember because I had joined uh, earlier that year, the countless conversations internally uh, 
you can imagine, like with lawyers and all stakeholders, <laughs> like you want to publish what? So I'm, I'm very happy and proud that the company decided to uh, take the step and, and we continued to publish ever since because it was a testament uh, to our commitment to the public, to the mission. And also this was extremely new. We have a few more players now but, um, and it still feels very much new for uh, probably 99% of the population. But back then, really, we wanted to put our money where our mouth was and share uh, as much information as we could to showcase that um, we had done, um, you know, due diligence before deploying this technology. It's the transparency that's continuing today. You have the report you put out with Swiss Re. And that, mm-hmm. was, that was eye-opening, to say the least. Yeah, you know, that was also a step in a slightly different direction because for the first time we wanted somebody else to uh, publish on our own performance uh, because of course uh, bias and, and transparency those are very thorny topics and so having uh, somebody and an agency that has the reputation of a Swiss RE, so a reinsurer really take uh, control of the data and, and publish their analysis um, following the insurance uh, standards and so you know it's a very specific set of data uh, associated with insurance claims um, not exactly the same type of data that was used for for the latest papers that we have released but it was very impactful um, and I hope that these type of studies will will continue to emerge. You have the, the common trend across the board since 2020 when you first published paper of transparency. When, you're inter- when, you, when your team is interacting with law enforcement or first responder, is it helping to build that trust when you're giving all the transparent documents out there and you posted videos as well? I believe it was in Phoenix of, I think it was the fire truck incident where you were, you were showing and simulating that. Is that all helping to build trust? I, I sure hope so. And uh, uh, in a way, I, I want to say it's a matter of safety culture. It's a matter of also, you know, how uh, people get to experience our technology and um, for sure, like get to learn about it through papers and whatnot. But one of the uh, maybe tidbits from the government and industry conference that I'm attending this week is every single uh template of the slides that you want to, you know, use for panels and presentation in the in the template, like before you input your content has this sentence and it says, science not communicated is science not done. So I do think that there's, you know, also as as part of the research community and scientific community for everybody in uh, Waymo safety research team, also pride in showcasing the, the work that we're doing again, yes, furthering that public discourse and, and trust overall. If you have pride, you do good. Yeah. So you have the safety framework. It's it's extremely well written. Or our listeners, I don't say viewers, but the listeners, I would recommend reading it. We'll put a link in the show notes for it because they're really well written, and we'll link to a lot of your other papers as well. Over time, Waymo's just business is growing. How do you envision the safety framework evolving as the business grows and expands? It has already evolved a lot, so that's also maybe a message that people don't always understand because once you write it in a paper, it's sort of kind of crystallized and and people may learn of it uh, six months later, a year later, uh, two years later, unfortunately, in some cases, and uh, they are amazed by it. And at that point, you've already changed a ton of things. And that's always, you know, one of the challenges with publication, if you will. But uh, what I mean by it having evolved a lot is really uh, something that we have also explained in papers, and it's uh, the data reliance. In 2020, when we were looking at our first ever deployment, like this had never been done before, all we had for ourselves were our estimates. We had done a lot of uh, simulation testing. We had done a lot of uh, closed course testing to validate the results of that simulation. We had done uh, public road testing with autonomous specialists and counterfactual simulations attached to it. But there wasn't any real rider only mile uh, out there. And when we look at these like seven plus, uh, it's a lot higher now, million of rider only miles that we have today, that does actually uh, have an impact on on how the safety framework intakes these different type of data. And so it's really important to understand based on the maturity and scale of a company, how your reliance on the data changes as your 
passing from testing on public roads with autonomous specialists to actual deployment with rider only. Uh, it changes your perspective because now you really are trying to um, evaluate more of a change compared to the past rider only software release that was approved, was deployed, showed um, adequate performance, and you want to improve from that. And so it's more of a, of a delta regression analysis and, and trends compared to the prior uh, software release still that produced uh, uh, rider only data. How does it change when you go from market to market? Now you're operating rider only in San Francisco, where I've ridden, your, and in Chandler, Phoenix, I've ridden there as well, and you're doing the Waymo One Tour, which I think is the coolest thing in the world because you're a band, you're the Waymo band, and you're, you're, you're on tour in LA, which a lot, of, a lot of great venues. There are things that change and there are things that, that don't change. We, we definitely have a playbook that has been applied pretty consistently. We always start small um, and, you know, that's when you do that type of more traditional testing with autonomous specialists on board, you start collecting uh, that type of data. But then there are things that, that do change because there is an ODD dependency uh, or operational design domain dependency in uh, some of the methodologies and, and some of the uh, targets that we use. And uh, the more quantitative targets, they need to be calibrated for the particular environment that uh, you're operating on. For example, um, you know, you may hold certain expectations for surface streets in terms of uh, progress, in terms of uh, collision rates, in terms of uh, ETAs and the like, and they may vary very widely for a highway environment. So that is going to, uh, you know, to trigger a change in, in the type of targets that you're using. But when you mention new targets, there's also a lot of field work and bottom-up work that needs to happen. For example, our field safety team, they have an incredible program where a team of experts really goes and trains and educates first responders. And that is work that needs to happen on the ground and needs to happen in every new market that, that we approach. When you approach these new markets, what role does the safety team play? So you mentioned you have the field safety team. I'm assuming that they're in that local market, understanding the local nuances. But from your perspective on the safety team, what role does the safety team team play? Are you looking at different simulations and different environments or what role are you playing? Yeah, and it really depends on on what's the change, like maybe if it's a completely new city versus um, looking at something like an expansion of territory uh, of, you know, a location in which we've been operating for a while. So depending on those, uh, the changes may be uh, more or less substantial and the role of safety team may be more or less substantial. We do have one particular team that's our uh, system safety team that uh, runs more traditional hazard analysis, for example. So any changes in the operational design domain do trigger ad hoc analysis of new things. One of the great examples that we had last year was when we enabled certain types of, of crossing, maybe with uh, light rail, and they had to do all these type of analysis that needed to provide information toward um, the next deployment readiness review, because we were applying for the first time a new software to the entire fleet that was going to enable these type of crossings. So that's one example. The field safety team uh, example is another one. We have an operational safety team that really is more on the ground for the testing operations and works a lot with our autonomous specialists as well as well and then of course the safety research team which is a team I am a part of where we want to study new markets understand how to calibrate the targets and so whether it is from surface streets to highways or whether it is from Phoenix to Austin like okay what is the environment today what is their performance in terms of safety today what type of collisions do they see is there something different particularly about this uh, uh, new city and new location uh, but things like also weather and, and whatnot does of course play play a role as well. Is this all tying to Waymo's layered approach to safety where it's not just one layer, there's there's multiple layers that goes into it? Yeah, for sure. Some of which are, are more related to the behavior of the Waymo driver in a new location, some operational. The architectural uh, layer, if you will, that's the third layer that we have, is the one that maybe dynamically evolves at a slightly slower pace compared to the other two layers, though we have announced a new platform, so eventually that will, will also come. But this notion of, of a layered approach really is there because we want to balance those things that we know we do well um, and that, you know, we, we say very often the Waymo driver uh, doesn't drive distracted, doesn't drive angry, doesn't drive under the influence and it doesn't speed. 
uh, which by the way was a big theme at the, at the keynote uh, earlier this morning here at the conference. But then you have to balance all of that goodness with the potential new risks and the potential new sources of harm that you are introducing. And that's where really the, the layered approach comes in to provide you that systematic and structured thinking about uh, new sources of harm. I'll summarize this with the Waymo driver drives smooth. Uh, that's uh, that's nice to hear. And and yes, uh, you know, we had the opportunity to host uh, a working group from ISO in December at the Google office in San Francisco, and everybody got Waymo rides. We're talking uh, roughly 30 international experts, so some coming from Europe, some coming from Asia. Uh, and it was so impactful for me to be able to share the technology with them and see their reactions after their first autonomous ride. And um, you could see uh, the eyes just, you know, um, like a kid on Christmas Day. It's like, oh my God, this really works. It's, it's really happening. So yeah, happy that they, you got to try the technology as well. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to your, your government relations team. You're doing the Waymo government relations team. You're doing it right. You had the Minister for Finance of Ireland recently in a vehicle and you had a prime minister in the vehicle and doing a really good job putting those elected officials in the vehicle. So now that I said that, we'll, we'll get back to safety, but I just want to give them a, a shout out for that because they're, it's doing it right because that's going to help you build the trust as you expand to new countries or, or new cities when you have those elected officials on your side. I want to dive in here into another paper, no surprise to you here. This is a, uh, a March 2023 paper titled, Building a Credible Case for Safety, Waymo's Approach for the Determination of Absence of Unreasonable Risk. In that paper, there's a lot written about the need for multiple safety approaches, which we, which we talked about a little bit today, to deploying an autonomous vehicle on public roads. In your opinion, what should this multiple safety approach look like, and how is Waymo implementing it? Yeah, and um, that is also, let's say, a variation of a question that, that we get uh, very often, because we have talked, we have published, and we've also you know, advocated with regulators that there shouldn't be a single metric for safety, and this really needs to be more of a, of a symphony of methodologies working together. And that's why in 2020, we had released all of these, let's say, heading titles of at least the, the methodologies that are used internally. And in this particular paper that you're mentioning, we do talk about this layered approach, how also it is a dynamic perspective of safety, because of course the software releases get updated pretty frequently. And so it is really more of a continuous um, improvement and continuous development cycle that needs to be supported by our safety framework. And then the credibility attached to it. And maybe this is the, the, the point that I wanna discuss a little bit more because you know, we have this concert of methodologies, but who's really telling you that they are the right methodologies <laughs> in the first place so that you're implementing them right? And that's really kind of the overlap or, or, or complementarity, maybe that's a better word, between the safety case and the safety framework at Waymo. We talked briefly about the safety framework, so the mission, the, the principles, and really the core methodologies that govern the decision-making for approval at Waymo, and yeah, we have a number of different methodologies. So what's really the role of, of a safety case? And the role, in my opinion, is that of exactly justifying why you picked the methodologies you picked and how you're using them. So when a decision maker and our safety board, which is the actual body that it's responsible for approving a software release, when they're looking at all of these uh, reports and pages and areas to flags and, and performance metrics that are provided to them, um, every single software release that needs to be approved, they, they see a number and they may question, it's like, well, how was this number computed? And that's when the, the safety case comes in and you have an explanation of what goes as an input to every single methodology. What are the inner workings so that the output actually looks like that? And so that's, that's four and it's not five. But then you may also ask like, well, is this the right metric to look at in the first place? And so you have to really make explicit every assumption you have made and justify uh, that maybe that's just the best that you could do at, at that point, but that holistically with all of the other metrics that you are uh, looking at, it's uh, sufficient to really responsibly put a new software release uh, on the road. So um, I don't know, maybe a bit of a non-answer to your question. That's a good answer. Uh, but I would say go, go read the paper yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot more there. The, the papers are good. They're, they're, they're very thorough. Where does the thoroughness come from? I've noticed that in everything that Waymo does from your papers to your public statements as, as an organization to 
the very smart, wise approach to deploying. Everything seems very thought out, very thorough. Where does that come from? You know, I think, again, it's a testament to the safety culture uh, at Waymo, but it does come from work class employees. Um, and I'm humbled every single day about the great minds that, that work at Waymo. And uh, all of us, we have such a different background, like, and, and the richness of, like, exposure to, to very different topics uh, that uh, each of us has and, and brings to the table. It's uh, really something different. Like, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to explain it un, until somebody comes and experiences it themselves. We, we do host, for example, um, a journal club. And at times we invite uh, guests, uh, external guests to join. And everybody comes out with the exact same opinion. It's like, oh, my God, you, you really bring together such a cross-functional team with a uh, thought leader and great creativity and ingenuity and thoroughness, as you were mentioning before. So I do think it comes from, from the people that work at Waymo. Everybody's very committed to the mission, whether it's for personal reasons or um, just, you know, societal impact. And it comes from there. The backgrounds of some of the Waymo nuts are great. You're, you have an um, aviation background, you have some individual NASA background, some individuals with transit and branding and finance. You have various, and you get this really great melting pot where it's not this everybody's looking the same way, everybody has a different opinion, and then we see what happens. You have a really great product that's scaling. And, and on the scaling aspect, you're now publicly uh, expanded to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport. Driving an airport is complicated. Getting, uh, when I pick somebody up, a friend at the airport. It, it's not nice. It's complicated. How does that change the safety case? Because that's a unique situation. We want to talk about behavioral science that people are not very happy. They're very stressed out and they're trying to zigzag and zoom, zoom, zoom. So how does that change the safety case? I would say that it, again, it does and it doesn't. Because when you look at the uh, Sky Harbor announcement, like the first announcement that we were going to start operating at the airport is from uh, November of 2022 if I'm not mistaken. So that's a year and, and three months uh, old. And we have just announced that, you know, we were going to start operating directly at the terminal because it, it wasn't like that before. So it does take uh, over a year of, of testing in an environment that is similar to the actual, you know, terminal stop, but, but not exactly as a chaotic um, as just stopping in front of the of the main door, right? And again, it speaks to this slow and steady approach to uh, to safety. And um, you know, in a way, highway I think may be a similar uh, type of type of topic where uh, we are just announcing that rider only operations will start, and it's going to be a very interesting challenge. What has to go into enabling rider only on highway? I'm assuming, based on historically, you've operated highway with safety tenants and in various different terms of testing. You probably done it on tracks and done it on, on public roads, and obviously you've done it in simulation. But what has to go to take that? I call it that leap, that that next step. Yeah, and uh, in certain senses, it is a leap. We have done testing with autonomous specialists, of course, and the plan once it will start, it's uh, just like for a new market. We're going to open it first to our employees so that we can have kind of a more tight round of feedback and then eventually it will be open to the public. Um, but I think in, in this particular case, we were not really starting from zero. We've been operating uh, the Waymo V line of the business for um, a few years. And so there are a lot of the learnings that, that can be shared. That's a very different platform. So that's the line of business applied to, to tracking. Uh, but there are um, information and data and the general like sensing and understanding of the highway environment that can be um, translated also for a passenger vehicle. At the same time, there are things that you, of course, want to um, analyze in more detail and that perhaps we're not part of the uh, safety framework for surface streets. So once you start enabling uh, higher speeds, you may have different dynamics in some of the possible collisions that you can foresee and you get to all, all sorts of uh, crazy things that may happen in a highway, rollovers and whatnot. And so those may kind of refocus some of the analysis that uh, we do and, and some of the scenarios that we test for. I was looking at a at a talk that uh, Drago, our head of research, was uh, giving recently. And he had all of these crazy scenarios of things that we observed uh, on a highway as we were testing with autonomous specialists. So that's really a treat and it's posted on YouTube. We had a case where there was like this uh, 
like full size barbecue grill kind of uh, dropping from the back of a pickup truck. Uh, there was another case in which one of um, those mobile homes was being transported. And so it's like, oh, how do these... Uh, perception working and, and how does the Waymo driver label that object? So he had all sorts of, of interesting scenarios. And um, again, some of those things in terms of yeah, categorization, labeling, uh, that that's a property of the Waymo driver. So uh, even uh, the data from Waymo via could, could be applied for that. Highway day is interesting. Tor coasted me last year out in Albuquerque. Um, two, two th- inter- a couple of interesting things to know, which I think are relevant to this conversation. One, I learned that Albuquerque has the highest ratio of beds on a highway because people passing through. That was interesting. And then they tell me this story. I'll tell you, and I didn't believe it, so they had to show me a video. <laughs> the video's not public, but I, I saw the video in my own two eyes. There was a guy dressed up as the Burger King guy with the crown, the whole outfit. He was playing Frogger. <laughs> no comment on what the situation was, but they had it on video, and I, and I couldn't believe it. So the stuff you see on highways is, let's call it interesting. Yeah, you give me an edge case for our uh, collision avoidance uh, team and, and also some perception work uh, to bring home. Yeah. Do you feel that the Waymo Via program helped accelerate the Waymo One program to be able to go at highway speeds because you had those learnings? You saw those, let's call them interesting edge cases that you wouldn't have necessarily had if you weren't operating that program? Yeah, I I definitely think so. And I don't know if this is naive of me to say, but I do think that uh, the transition from surface streets to highway is an easier transition than from the highway environment to uh, busy surface streets. So um, I think it's it's not just the learnings from Waymo Via, but it's also, of course, um, everything that we have learned and uh, have shared across the fleet from surface streets operations and especially our operations for the past three years. You've learned a lot, and, there, and there's data to back that up, because Waymo successfully driven over 7 million miles of fully autonomous in rider-only mode equaling 700,000 ride handling trips with public riders and no human driver. That's impressive. I've been a few of those miles and really have enjoyed it. From a safety perspective, how is that accomplished? And I, I keep going back to my rides. They're flawless. And, and to your U, UI, UX team, uh, I'm, I'm the lazy guy who doesn't want to connect my Bluetooth, but you have a really great curated music list in there. So shout out to the UX, UI team on the on that. But from a, getting to your specialty from um, a um, safety perspective, how is that accomplished? Well, there's there's a lot that goes into it, but maybe one angle to explore is really this recognition that safety doesn't stop at, at an approval. Um, because very often we're talking about the safety framework, the safety case, and very often the use case in which those um, topics are surfaced is the case of approval of a new software release. Well, what happens you know, one minute after approval, uh, like you push a button and it's uh, and it's deployed. Um, no, even that is done very, very gradually uh, with uh, 24-7 monitoring at all times. And so it really is a combination of, if you will, the, the governance and the decision making and the safety by design that does build the safety framework, but then combined with our operational safety, combined with um, field operations, again, 24-7, and, and Waymo nuts that are all committed to the, the same cause. And so one minute after this software release is approved, well, guess what? There's already another one in the queue uh, that is getting ready for the next approval cycle. And so the work really never stops, and, and it does take a, a pretty committed team to now start in taking the data uh, that they are observing, uh, making sure that any estimate or any assumption that uh, might have been made for the present release is in fact validated on the road. And so really the role of, of validation through use and, and validation from the data that we observed uh, on the road. So um, I, I think that you know the, the more you scale and the more you deploy, the faster you are actually learning and again sharing all these learnings across the fleet. So hopefully in a way it's going to become easier uh, in the future, but I'm pretty proud that regardless of all of the progress, the company is maintaining its posture of really this this gradual and uh, purposeful scaling. Scaling, before you scale to test, you've tested in 13 states in the United States and I live in Florida and you publicly test there several times and one time you're actually there during a hurricane and, and monsoon weather. What goes into that from, from a safety perspective? So you're in some of this Florida, you can't see. From me to you, I can't. Though the rain's coming down so hard or the winds, the hurricane brings these winds, and that's a an edge case into itself. 
what goes into that from a testing from a safety perspective? I think that you know the some of the information that we put out there really discusses how we do choose certain cities and, and certain states because we want to widen the exposure to certain particular um, you know features or attributes of the operational design domain that we were mentioning before. So it could be weather. And so I know we were at some point doing some testing like in the Death Valley for extreme temperatures and then, of course, testing for uh, heavy rain, testing for snow. So there is an aspect of it which is trying to push the boundaries of uh, your capabilities a little more, but not necessarily with the intention of operating in that particular location, but with the intention of understanding better how you respond to certain conditions that may be less likely in the cities where you have actually deployed, and so you go elsewhere to kind of uh, capture that, that data and make sure that you are not um, you know, found unprepared for something that is maybe less likely, but still reasonably foreseeable to happen in, in Phoenix or um, in San Francisco. You're learning. Yeah, definitely. There's there's still a lot of learning and a long way to go. And Phoenix, um, I've been stuck at Sky Harbor because it got so hot the plane couldn't take off. And so, you, I mean, not as hot as Death Valley, but you've seen that. And a couple of days ago, it snowed in the Florida Panhandle. And so you've, you've learned that. When you test in these diverse weather environments, does that help make a better Waymo driver at the end of the day because you're learning all these different scenarios? Yes, for sure. Um, but I, I don't know that it's uh, always just the Waymo driver that you're trying to make better. Sometimes you're trying to validate certain types of simulations or, or certain types of, of tooling that you're developing internally. And so it's the Waymo driver, it's the Waymo service also, you know, as a, as a wider maybe subject or topic of, of analysis. And so everything that you can learn. Sometimes learnings are, are operational. It's like, okay, is there anything that we can adjust for pickups and drop-offs if it's raining? And so there are uh, very important learnings that come from, from testing in, in weather or in other types of, you know, situations that really explore the range of, of features that a location can provide to you. Pickups and drop off, uh, drop offs are a hot topic in the industry now. Is that something that you're looking at from a, a safety perspective of where's the best place to pick an individual up? Perhaps you see data that it has a higher. I used to live in Beverly Hills when we ran the AV task force. A higher concentration of elderly individuals that had to load at a certain place because of the, the curb height. Do you, do you look into that from a safety perspective? What is the safest place to optimally? pick up and drop off your passengers? Definitely, yes. And I'm going to switch hat for a second. But, you know, as part of the SAE ORAD uh, committee, um, we were recently evaluating a draft. It actually went went back to um, get certain revisions uh, in place. But it was a document related to accessibility. And so um, a lot of the debates that we were having in, in these, you know, multi-industry and also academic working groups was like, OK, how do we want to uh, set up the, the problem of pickups and drop-offs for accessibility? reasons, uh, be it um, a weather situation, like it's raining versus not, be it grade of the road, so like how do we want the vehicle to park or stop so that uh, differently abled people can uh, more easily access the vehicle. So it's definitely top of mind. Um, there are safety topics. There is, of course, a lot of logistics and, and operational um, angles as well into that. It's very clear from this conversation and all the, the public documents that Wayne was published, you're really thinking the whole process through. Yeah, and that's that's really maybe more of what we were discussing before with the layered approach to safety is really enable uh, or enabling that type of systematic thinking through each of the problems. And the spectrum is, is quite large of, of problems that you need to tackle, but we do think that the framework that we have established and, and the approach for the safety case is helping us uh, tackle you know one problem at a time, but we do have a dedicated team. In your opinion, what is the future of Waymo? Maybe just one word, exciting. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, we have a, a team that is uh, steadfast, committed to safe, reliable, sustainable, and accessible transportation. So yeah, I don't have any other words than exciting. Exciting. OK, I'll give you a word. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Francesca, this, is, this has been great. Waymo is doing really great things. And as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Maybe two things. The first one is try to go and experience the technology for yourself before you make an opinion for it. Um, and that's really something that we have seen over and over and over because skepticism for something so new is just natural. So if you have a chance, go and try it, whether it's in Phoenix or whether it's in San Francisco. Um, and then the second one is if you want to learn more 
uh, go and read. It's not just the, the Waymo.com slash safety. That's the one that, you know, I personally use the most. That's where all our team's paper go. But there's also another website. That's Waymo.com uh, slash research. That's where all of the research on AI and machine learning is housed, and it's mind-blowing. And sometimes I have a very hard time understanding some of these <laughs> papers myself, but there's a wealth of information if you know people want to uh, understand a little bit more. I agree with the Go experience. Here's one last one for you. When do we get to a point where individuals book their, their travel and, and holidays around where you're operating so they can go experience it? Well, I hope soon. <laughs> <laughs> I do too, because it's, it, my daughter's been in probably a dozen uh, autonomous vehicles, and my wife actually brought up, we should take her to, to Phoenix, and she could ride in the Waymo vehicle. See, so it's it's starting, and that's where this came from. As my wife says, and, and Francesca says, go experience a ride in a Waymo. It's the future, and it's game-changing. Today is tomorrow. Tomorrow is today. The future is Waymo. Francesca, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.